Okay, well, we're patching through on a handheld telephone, so if we sound a little tinny, uh, we're doing the best we can. I'm not exactly sure how much uh, our listeners heard, and so sorry for the very bumpy beginning, but uh, uh, I'll start over again here. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines the word inspiration as a divine influence or action when a person believes to qualify him or her to receive and communicate sacred revelation. Mark Allen's been inspiring people for over 35 years with his books and audio presentations and music. He's the co-founder of New World Library, and he has authored eight books, five audio CD sets, five um, albums of original music. Part of Mark's gift is being able to present metaphysical concepts that, when consistently used, can produce tangible results in our third-dimension reality. Mark's latest 316-page book, The Magical Path, is not a volume of poof, here's your dream life, instantaneous promises, but rather a step-by-step outline of mental principles that, if applied consistently over time, will move you in the direction of your lofty dreams. Many years ago, Napoleon Hill wrote in his book, Think and Grow Rich, whatever the mind can conceive and believe it can achieve. Hill went on to explain that except for the things that you see in nature, everything else around you began as an idea in someone's mind. This means that your ideas can also become real, too. Mark Allen's book, The Magical Path, is a how-to guide to har- for harnessing the creative power of our, of our imagination and focus in an easy and relaxed manner and in a healthy and positive way for the highest good of all. You'll want to take notes for this conversation. And be sure to visit Mark Allen's website. It's markallen.com, and Mark is spelled M-A-R-C, and the rest is A-L-L-E-N. And do stop by Mark Allen's publishing company's website for New World Library. It's newworldlibrary.com. Mark, sorry about the bumpy start, but are you there? Welcome to the program. No problem. I'm here, and I hear you loud and clear, Scott. Good, good. Glad to be here. Thank you. This is the first time we've had to do a program over the phone, and I was just telling Brett that when we started our program back in January, in the dead of winter here in New Jersey, I wasn't thinking about the 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 ongoing problem we have here on the on the east coast of thunderstorms and inclement weather, usually right about this time of day. So we will muddle through and hope that our power doesn't go out. <laughs> so I vividly remember one day back in the late 80s uh, picking up a small book with an unusual colorful uh, piece of artwork on the front, and it was titled, As You Think. I then bought the cassette version, and like you, I read and listened to it many, many times, so much that I memorized large portions of this book, and eventually I did my own recording. So I want to thank you for introducing me to one of my all-time favorite inspirational writers, James Allen. I reread that book about once a year, and I'm always left touched, moved, and inspired. It is a brilliant book. When I look back, it's one of the top three books that have changed my life, totally transformed my life from one of poverty and anxiety to uh, a real satisfaction with life and an abundance I couldn't even imagine when I was mm-hmm. 30. Every time I either read the book or I or I listen to it on, on a recording, uh, I, I'm always touched at just the, the sheer beauty of the words. There's yes. just beautiful, beautiful uh, writing. I write about it in The Magical Path and say, uh, in a way, The Magical Path is the most simple and concrete book I've ever written. And all I did was look back over the little simple things I did that changed my life and recorded them all. I thought at first it would be a much smaller book. But one thing I did was take big phrases from James Allen's book. I started that in my late 20s and put them up on my wall, put them in front of my face by the phone. Like I remember the first one vividly. I kept staring at it long enough until I absorbed it deeply. And the phrase is, from as you think, you will become as great as your dominant aspiration. If you cherish a vision, a dream, a lofty ideal in your heart, you will realize it. Told with such authority and power. Yes, it's a brilliant book. Written in 1904, so it shows there's nothing new. Uh, indeed. And he was inspired by someone else, and he, he sort of like took the mantle and carried it on, and and yeah. uh, it just went on from there. And 
you know, it's a great thing that we keep discovering this book and then reissuing it and, and recording it and, and turning other people on to it. It's a, an amazing yeah. thing. You know, Mark, it, your life is a genuine uh, self-doubt, rags to riches to happiness story. And since we have you for two hours, let's start by telling our listeners about the old version of Mark Allen and who you <laughs> became by using several simple but esoteric principles. <laughs> yes, yes, it it has been a uh, long and winding path, which which we all have when we look back on it. But uh, when I look back on my twenties, I definitely was a clueless wanderer with no sense of direction, but a lot of anxiety. I I left college halfway through my senior year because I got into a theater company writing music and acting, which was all good. And looking back, I realized one good thing about it all. One thing I learned very early was I knew it was important to do what I loved. So I became a musician and an actor. My father just stressed, no, 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 go study business. That has security. He even literally said, you only work 40 hours for a corporation, and you still have 40 other hours a week to do something creative. <laughs> and I remember thinking, no, Dad, if I worked 40 hours a week in a job I didn't like, I'd need another 40 hours to recover. <laughs> and and I, I had two older brothers. The oldest did everything the parents wanted. He was the parents' dream. He was an athletic star in high school and college, and went on to business, a business degree and joined a large corporation with, in a good job, you know. Married the perfect wife and had two kids and was father of the year in his community. I mean, he was the parent's dream. Then my other brother came along. He was the parent's nightmare, this total, total rebel. And I looked at both my older brothers, and I think I got early on and even subconsciously, it was years before I could express it in words, but... My older brother wasn't really passionate about his work at all. He didn't really talk about it. He was passionate about golf and fishing. And my middle brother was just fighting all the time, fighting. And I came to realize you can't do what your parents want you to do. You have to do what you want to do. But it doesn't do any good fighting them either because whatever we fight against, whatever we rebel against, we're empowering that very thing. We're giving them our attention. So I just came along, and I did what I wanted to do, and I didn't fight with my folks. I ignored my dad. I didn't go into business. I studied theater and music and got a great job. However, I was filled with anxieties in my late teens, early 20s, periods of depression. I'm glad it was back in the 60s because they didn't have all these pharmaceuticals. Right now, now, probably, they just would have zoned me out on some kind of pill, and that would have been end of the story. Right. But then I, I had to work through it. And everything in my 20s that I touched kept falling apart. I, I had the, sort of the opposite of the Midas touch. I joined this theater company, then it fell apart. Then I joined another theater company, and that fell apart. And then I wondered, I followed my girlfriend into a Zen center, and I got kicked out for breaking the rules. And then I wandered around. I had a rock band that fell apart. And I, I was a spiritual seeker, I guess you could say, in the, what we call the smorgasbord, the spiritual smorgasbord of Berkeley, California in the 70s. And huh. took all these workshops and things because I had this constant, ongoing anxiety. And then my late 20s, I don't even... Remember what I did. I, I did a bunch of little jobs. I got fired as a busboy and dishwasher for not working fast enough. I did, lasted one day during doing yard work. That was so hard. I, I lasted a day. I got fired as a typesetter for not showing up on time. And, and then I turned 30. And that was the day that changed my life. That one day changed my life. In a way, looking back, I could almost make the case anyway that I was a different person at the end of that day than I was at the beginning. Because I woke up in a state of shock. I realized I wasn't a kid anymore. Somehow through my late 20s, it was okay. It was cool, in fact, to be sort of a poverty case artist, spiritual seeker, 
having nothing happening, scrounging, a word we use all the time, scrounging every month to come up with a rent for this little one-room cheap apartment in a bad place, a bad part of Oakland, California. That's where I ended up. And I woke up in a state of shock. I realized I was 30. I wasn't a kid anymore. And I spent most of the day pacing up and down in my room. I couldn't have a party. I had to think about my life. And looking back, that was a good thing to do because I hadn't really thought about my life and what I wanted to do. I had just sort of wandered around in my 20s without a, a real clear goal at all. And I remember this game I'd played years before. Is that a commercial break? Yeah, we got about 30 seconds. Go on. Okay. I remember this game I'd played where this couple once asked us, when I was 22 sitting around a fire, to play this game, imagining five years have passed and everything has gone as well as our life, as well as we could imagine. What would our life look like? And I didn't remember a word of what I said at 22. But at age 30, I remembered it. And this time I took a sheet of paper and wrote it down. And that's what changed my life. Mark, on the other side of the break, let's get into that and uh, we'll pick it up from there. We're going to take a little bit of a commercial break. We'll be right back. Okay, we are back with... Uh, okay, Mark, are you still there? Yep, I'm here. Okay, great. So sorry for the for the uh, problems we're having this evening. Yikes. Okay, you were talking about uh, uh, when you turned 30 years of age and you remembered uh, a little game you had played a few years before that. Tell us about that. Yeah, it, uh, it changed my life, this simple little game. And in a way, when I look back, uh, it's the single thing I did that had the most impact in, in changing my life. When I was about 22, I followed my girlfriend into a back-to-the-land experiment that was a total disaster. It lasted about five freezing cold months in an Oregon winter. But uh, I remembered the day I turned 30 that one night we were sitting around a fire and this couple said, let's play this game we play at church camp. Let's imagine five years have passed and everything has gone as well as you could imagine. What does your life look like? What's your ideal scene? They called it ideal scene, which looking back, it's it's a better way to express it than ideal life, because ideal life can sound a little scary. But just ideal scene, okay, five years have passed. What's your ideal scene look like? Well, I don't remember a word of what I said. We went around the fire, and I don't remember a thing about it, so it had no impact on my life. But the day I turned 30, I remembered playing that game as I paced up and down my little slum apartment. And I thought, this is a good idea. I should do this. But this time, I grabbed a pen and a piece of paper, and I wrote ideal scene at the top in big letters. And then I imagined I was 35 already. Five years had passed. But I was living my ideal life. What did my life look like? And I was amazed at what spilled out. And looking back, that moment, those few minutes that it took me, literally five or ten minutes, gave my life focus and direction that I'd never had before. Much to my amazement, what spilled out was, I have this successful publishing company. I'd never even thought of it before. I'd been a musician and an actor and done all these odd jobs. I'd never written a book. And I wrote, it publishes books I've written. And my friends, and my music as well. I'd never recorded music. And it's very successful. And I have a big white house on the hill in Marin County. Marin County, north of San Francisco, was heaven to me. I lived in the slums of Oakland. And I'd driven through Marin a few times. And it's open and green and beautiful, beautiful. And my doubts and fears, I remember, were just rushing in, saying, impossible, you know. Uh, I remember vividly what they said. I remember they said, it's way too much, Mark. Just pick on one thing and focus on it. You want to get into business and write and record music and get into real estate, that's way too much. And I realized right then, real early on, dealing with my doubts and fears would be essential. And in fact, now when I look back on it, the older I get, 
but more simply as he thinks and can express them. And I, I realize there's just two essential things to do, at least for me. There was just, there were two essential things. One, dare to dream and dare to make clear goals and go for them. And two, deal with all the doubts and fears that inevitably come up. And that's exactly what I did. I, I ended up writing down my ideal scene. Then even as I thought through it, I, I put my doubts and fears aside for a while. I even got around them by saying, because they, they kept saying impossible, impossible. I said, let me experiment. Let me get... I, I'd heard a story of Buckminster Fuller, who was mm-hmm. this visionary speaker in the 60s and 70s. I never heard him, but somebody was talking about him and said that, Buckminster Fuller said that in his 20s, he decided to either commit suicide or look at his life as this unique experiment. And fortunately, he chose the experiment. I just remembered that word, experiment. And that's how I got around my doubts and fears. The day I turned 30, I literally started writing my ideal scene and doubts and fears just overwhelm me. It's way too much, Mark. Pick one thing, and I knew whatever I picked, my doubts and fears had come up. Oh, you think you could be a successful business person? You think you could be a successful writer? Look at your life. You've been a total failure at everything you've touched. The doubts and fears were just overwhelming. But I literally said to my doubts and fears, look, I want to go for this dream. I even want to do it in my own lazy way. Because I realized as I dared dream my ideal, oh, I not only wanted success in the world, but I wanted musicians' hours. I didn't want to work mornings. I don't want to work Mondays even. I just want to work when I feel like it. I'm lazy. I'm a late sleeper. I always have been. I'm not a morning person. So that became part of my deal. ideal. I want to sleep late. I want to work when I feel like it. I want to create a successful company and write books and record music and get into real estate and do it all. That's my ideal. Doubts and fears that impossible, way too much, never been done. And you can't do it in your own lazy way. You've got to work hard for a startup business. My doubts and fears had just this endless litany of doubts and fears. And I literally said to them, look, let me try it as an experiment to go for my dreams in my own lazy way. My doubts and fears that impossible will never work out. I think most of my thoughts agreed with them that it it can't possibly work out. You can't be lazy and be successful. But I said to them, let me try this unique experiment. Let me go for my dreams in my own lazy way. It won't work. It won't work. Good. I said, well, if it doesn't work, I'll be no worse off than I am now. Mm-hmm. I had no job. I had no income at all. I had no money saved. I had no family support. I was a total poverty case. And even my own doubts and fears had to say, well, yeah, I guess that's true. It can't get any worse. So that's how I got around. I said, let me try this experiment for a year. My lazy part of me loved it because I allowed myself to be as lazy as I wanted to be and yet focused on this dream and taking the first obvious steps that were always in front of me. Wow. On the other side of the break, Mark, let's talk about that first year and what that was like, because uh, I, I know where your story goes, and it, it was, your success was not instantaneous, so I want to hear this, and I know our listeners do, too. We'll be right back, folks, with more Far Out Radio. Okay, gang, we are back with our third, with our last segment for this hour, and our guest this evening is Mark Allen. He is a writer, author, publisher, businessman, musician, um, all-around uh, inspirational guru here. He's quite a fellow, and we're talking about his new book, The Magical Path. Mark, before you get into that first year, I've got to ask you, since your 20s was a, a decade of uh, trying this, that, and the other thing and with no interest at all in, in, in uh, business or anything like that, and you hadn't right. written anything, where in the world did this, this notion of writing and publishing and starting a business come from? Did you ever get an idea or a clue where that came from? No, I have no idea. I, I, I was amazed when I turned 30 and wrote Ideal Scene at the top of the pen. Just asked myself, okay, what do I want to be doing in five years? What, what do I want to do? I, 
it just spilled out. I have a successful publishing company. I worked in my 20s a few times with a couple little publishing companies connected with various organizations of, of teachers. So I got, I saw, I had seen a few little companies in action, but I had never had the conscious thought, oh, I want to do that too. It, it, it surprised me as much as it surprised all my friends. And hmm. <laughs> I even told my dad, I was, it was my birthday, I called my po- folks, or they called or something, and I said, I'm going to start a business. And my dad's first words were, well, you know, 80% of businesses fail in their first two years. <laughs> oh, thanks, Dad. And yeah, I, that's thanks, Dad. And, and the thought, I realized, oh, I, here's one of these guys, like, many, unfortunately, many of our friends and even our family, uh, he was one of those people I couldn't share my dreams with. I had to do it first, and then he'd see it. Otherwise, he was skeptical. And that's why he never dared start a business. He worked for the same corporation for 35 years. And at the end, looked back and said, you know, by the time he retired, I was successful. And he looked back and said, you know, if I had to do over again, I'd do it differently. Hmm. I knew what he meant. He meant he'd dare do what he really dreamed of. Like, he, his passion was like woodworking. And he could have done something with his woodworking. He made model trains and beautiful things in his spare time. And when he retired. He could have turned that into a career. Instead, he pushed paper for a corporation in a job he really didn't like for 35 mm-hmm. years. Wow, wow, wow. There's probably a million of those stories out there. So yeah. tell us about that first year. You made a grand declaration, and yeah. uh, everything just fell right into place, right? Well, no. In fact, it was uh, the first five years were total struggle. If I knew then what I know now, I would have moved through it much faster. For one thing, I had no idea of how business worked or how uh, how money works or how you could use financing and different possibilities open to people. Uh, as I did things, I learned all kinds of things. Like uh, early on, I learned about, and it was just because a friend of mine gave me a business plan that a film company had had put together. It wasn't even a film company. It was some creative people. They wanted to raise money for a movie. And I looked at the plan, and I said, this is a brilliant concept. It was called a limited partnership. I'd never heard about it at all or anything. And I realized, oh, this can not only work for movies and Broadway plays, which have used that structure for years, it can work for any kind of creative artist that can create any like series of things. Like, you're an artist with your drawings. You could have a collection of drawings. Or I had my books and music, so I could have individual books, and I even had a music series that I put together of four albums and treated each one like a movie or Broadway play where you basically get money from investors to invest in the creation of that product, that creative thing. And you split money 50-50. They're not loaning you the money. It's not a loan. You don't have to pay them back. It's a high-risk investment. They could lose every dime. Or it's potentially a high-reward investment because they get 50% of the profits. We did this for a book, raised the money. We raised $50,000. We knew it would be a big book and it, because it was Shakti Kawain. And she had already done real well with creative visualization. Mm-hmm. So her second book, Living the Light, we raised $50,000. We needed cash. And we even said to people, you can do anything you want with the money as long as there's full disclosure. We said $25,000 is just going into our expenses. It's going into my salary. It's going into overhead. But the other $25,000 will produce and market Shakti's book. And you're going to get 50% of profit. And to even make it clearer, we even said, okay, profits will define very clearly. We even just boiled it down. We said, okay, we'll, we'll say it's a buck a book, profit. And so investors will get 50 cents a book back. And we even escalated it at first. I said they get 75 cents a book till they recoup their money, 50 cents thereafter. Well, investors got eight times their money back. 
that was our best. Wow. We did it for another book they about broke even. Did it for the music they about broke even. But it turns out it's a great tool for creative people. <clears throat> but I didn't know that when I began. When I began, I knew nothing about business. All I could think of was, well, let's see, i got to finance this somehow. I didn't even know about loans or venture capital or local angels, all stuff I learned about later. All I could think of was, well, get a job, any kind of job, and save 20% and put it into your company. So I looked around, and I ended up getting a horrible job that started at 8.30 in the morning, typesetting. Uh-huh. And I did that for a while, a couple months only, because I looked around and I found a better typesetting job from 4 p.m. to midnight, typesetting a uh, daily paper. And I loved that. That was that was fun. And that freed me up to sleep late and do something in the early afternoon around my company. And then I went to work. But I got fired from that job for not showing up on time. And that turned out to be the best thing that ever happened because I by that time then I knew how to do typesetting and I started just doing it on my own. I started picking up books to typeset and a scientific journal. Different things and I was immediately making four or five times as much money typesetting on my own. So I set up my own little company called Whatever Book Works and ended up using that money to finance my publishing. Was that called Whatever Publishing? At first, we were called Whatever Publishing. I remember hearing that on, maybe it was the audio cassette version of your uh, As a, or as You Think. Right, right. Mm-hmm. For our first maybe six years, we were Whatever Publishing. But we kept getting dissed. As it, we kept, we, we didn't, the name didn't generate respect. <laughs> and finally, in the mid-80s, I think it was, we changed it to World Life. Mm-hmm. Huh. Well, that is quite a story, uh, Mark. <laughs> and uh, were you, I'm just curious because I used to be in graphic arts um, back in the 80s. Were you using a, uh, a composer machine? Yeah, we, we were the, some of the first um, computerized photo typesetting. There was a little, the, the funky sort of Ford version was CompuGraphic yeah. that I used. And then there was also the Harris TXT, which was a much better machine. Uh, but yeah, we had these little CompuGraphic things that printed out photo, uh, printed out type on, on uh, paper, Kodak paper. Yeah, it was a photo paper. I mean, the type was was beautiful, crisp, and clean. And mm-hmm. every now and then, I think of those machines because they, they were all over the place in the, many many of the places that I worked, and I. I often reflect back on that and think, boy, those were expensive machines, and they were state-of-the-art, and boy, they sure went away in a hurry. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I am I was early enough, I came in just as they replaced those huge, hot, lit, hot metal machines, that, these huge Rube Goldberg contraptions that all mm-hmm. the papers had and printers and publishers had that, that were these huge machines that really poured hot lead I mean, it must have been terribly unhealthy. Yes. Into the letters, and then I learned it was then uh, early '70s, about 1970. Then suddenly, photo typesetting came in, mm-hmm. and compu graphics, and those machines. Within a year, they went from costing thirty-five thousand each to being junk. Yeah. Being absolutely worthless junk. And well, all the old typesetters lost their jobs because they couldn't type. And the secretaries took over typesetting, mostly women. Mm -hmm. And there were huge changes in the industry very fast. Yes, I remember it well. And waxer machines and galley and and paste up and overlays and registration marks and all that kind of of stuff. I loved that. I loved waxing the galleys and cutting them up and pasting each page you created by hand, basically. Yeah. I found I really enjoyed that work. I just, I love making books. Books have changed my life. Mm-hmm. So I I loved making, making a book. Those, the old way of doing things had a real tactile quality to it. It took manual dexterity and a good eye 
and a sense of lining things up and making sure that it, that it was all clean and and, and all together. It was uh, there was actually quite an art to doing that kind of stuff, paste up work. Oh yeah, yeah. Wow. Well, Mark, we're at the top of the hour, so we're going to take a little bit of a break, do some news, do some commercial business. And uh, on the other side, let's dig into your book, and uh, we'll have some fun with that. You're listening to Far Out Radio this evening, and my guest is Mark Allen. He's the author of the new book, The Magical Path, and he's also the owner of New World Library. And You can check out all of his work at markallen.com, and you can check out his company's website at newworldlibrary.com. And we'll be right back. <laughs> 